might still be a few late comers coming in, but it is 11 o'clock, so I think we can start. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you for being here. Um, I'm used to doing this session for about three people, so I'm very impressed with today's turnout. Um, unfortunately for me, this session is being recorded, so I'm going to have to sit. So I hope you can all see me when I sit down, and I hope you can all hear me. Please indicate if you have trouble hearing me, and I know I, I tend to look in one direction, so I'm not ignoring you guys, I just tend to do that. Um, okay, let me introduce myself. My name is Mimi seifert Wirt. I am the manager for digital scholarship here at the library. Um, now, I want to talk to you today about open access. Um, firstly, if you have not heard about the Division of Digital Scholarship, please don't be alarmed. We basically have a new name. We used to be known as Digitization and Digital Services, but all you have to know is that we are responsible for the open access initiatives at this library. Okay. So, regarding open access initiatives, these are some of the things that I want to talk to you today about. Um, what we're basically going to cover in this session is the following. We're going to talk shortly about what open access is, the philosophy around it. Um, we will then look at some of our initiatives at the library, and I specifically want to concentrate on three things, namely the institutional repository, Sun Scholar, the open access publication fund, and the self-archiving policy of the university. <coughs> We will then spend some time looking at open access journals, open access publishing in general, and lastly look at the potential benefits of publishing open access. Uh, before I go any further, I would just like to make it clear that um, with these type of presentations, the library is not predicting to any researcher or student where to publish. Um, open access is a form of publishing which has become accepted in the academic world and is part of scholarly communication and we do believe it and we ad do advocate it for it but please don't take the wrong message away that we are trying to tell anybody where they should publish that is not the idea of this session okay yes, yes we will come to that yes okay so if we just look quickly at the philosophy of open access, it basically means to provide uh, free of charge and unhindered access to research and its publications or outputs. Open access literature can be defined as digital, online, free of charge, and free of most copyright and licensing restrictions. Um, and through the years, there have been various initiatives driving open access. Um, I do mention some of them on the slide, but I'm not going to give you a history lesson on that. It just basically means that open access today, after advocating for about the last 20 years, has become an established practice in the world of scholarly communication. And open access publications are not necessarily doubted for their authenticity or quality anymore, as was the case a few years ago. So I think that's important to notice. Um, it's also generally accepted, and there is literature to prove this, that contributors to open access obtain increased visibility and increased global presence, increased accessibility to their research output, increased collaboration, and eventually increased impact. And another thing which I think is important to note is that this university supports open access it became a signatory of the Berlin Declaration of Open Access in 2010. And doing that, um, it basically committed itself to, in the first place, implementing policy, encouraging researchers to deposit copies of their published research in an institutional repository. And secondly, to encourage researchers to publish in open access journals where, where a suitable journal is available. And that's important. We'll get to the repository part and the self-archiving. Um, but also just if we actually look at that Berlin Declaration, it clearly states, encourage researchers to publish in OA journals where suitable journals exist. So once again, just coming back to stating that we're not saying 
you know, go publish only open access. It might be that in your discipline, an open access accredited journal does not exist. Okay. So, moving on. There are two routes for open access, and with this we mean two channels for how scholarly research is made openly available. You'll see that it's gold and green, but unfortunately doesn't have anything to do with South African sport. Um, firstly, with regards to gold open access, this is where the journal itself makes um, published uh, articles uh, immediately and freely available in peer-reviewed journals. And the second route is green repository, green or green open access, and this is where the access is actually delivered by an institutional repository, um, and it becomes freely available via the repository and not the journal itself. There is, of course, also now talk of platinum open access. In this model, the access is free to the reader and also to the author. So it means no article publishing of article processing charges or anything in, in that sense. Important to note that, for instance, with regards to gold open access, although the articles are freely available for the user, it doesn't mean that there is not a cost involved in producing the articles. So things like APCs may apply even in fully open access journals. Okay. Also take note of hybrid open access journals, which are quite common these days. They provide open access only for some articles, usually where some form of payment has occurred, and then uh, journals which sort of offer delayed open access, which means that an article will be closed for a certain time after an, and then go open after an embargo period. With regards to permissions, with regards to if you as a user using open access, I think it's also just important to note that there are two types of permissions regarding, regarding OA. The one is gratis, which basically means free. In this case, it means that the price barriers have been removed, so the user does not pay to access the content. The other form is libre, and this is where once in, the, the price barriers has been removed, so the user is not paying for the content, but also some of the permissions may have been removed. So this means that, for example, you as a user may be able to access an article, but you also may be able to redistribute it or adapt it. And I think it's just important that one realizes this and that we realize that there are licenses specifying this use. And on that note, I quickly want to make you aware of some of these licenses. In the world of open access, you will often come across Creative Commons licenses. I don't know if anybody here has come across it or is familiar with it. Um, just to give you some background, Creative Commons is an organization which provides free, easy to use copyright licenses to make simple and standardized way to give the public permission to share and use an author's creative work on the conditions that that author chooses. Okay, so what you often see in an open access journal is right at the bottom, you'll see one of these, sorry, I don't have a pointer now, but um, one of these, I, or, or these sort of blocks with icons. Um, I've got two examples here of Creative Commons licenses. The first one is an attribution license, which lies on the one end of the scale. Um, let me just get my notes here. Yes, an attribution license, this means that others are allowed to redistribute, remix, tweak, or build upon an author's work as long as they credit the original author. On the other end of the scale of Creative Commons licenses, the most restrictive one is the one on the bottom there. It is the attribution non-commercial non-derivative license and in that case, an author, uh, a user may download an author's work, share it with others. Thank you so much. Oh, great. Yeah, that's the bottom one I'm talking about. Um, share it with others, but, not, uh, but is not allowed to change it in any way or to distribute it commercially. So between those two, 
you get a whole lot of other um, Creative Commons licenses. So it's just something to note. And of course, not all journals, even open access journals, use Creative Commons licenses, but they will have somewhere on their website, they will have uh, rights, permissions, and licenses. And it's just important as a user and also as a publisher in open access to be aware of this. Okay. So now, open access initiatives at Stellenbosch University Library. Importantly, in the first place, is how to get to information on open access. Quite simply, on the library's webpage, on the first page, you will find this, and there is open access. Another way to get to it is to look under services on the library's website. And there you will find various links to all of, all of which I'm going to be discussing today. So firstly, I said I wanted to concentrate on the institutional repository. Now, an institutional repository, or we call it IR for short, um, is basically a digital archive for the preservation and dissemination of research output of a specific institution, in this case Stellenbosch. The output we're talking about is peer-reviewed output. It's usually in the forms of theses and dissertations, but also contains research articles, conference proceedings, and secondary materials such as inaugural addresses is also included in our case. Now, our institutional um, repository is, is called Sun Scholar, and I really hope that all of you are familiar with it. Um, you should be, because, this, of course, it is also the place where one's uh, thesis and dissertation at this university will, will eventually end up after submission. Okay. Another thing to notice here is we talk about the fact that we only allow peer-reviewed research output in Sun Scholar. This is very important because we need to have this, or we need to do that, to be regarded and recognized and as an accredited um, institutional repository, which we are. It's also important to realize that the repository and the information in it is harvested by various large harvesters which means that, for example, you can use a tool like Google, a search engine like Google, or something like Google Scholar to search Sun Scholar, and you will also find um, the material in Sun Scholar coming up in your Google Scholar search and various other databases. So that's on our side, on an administrative part, it's important for us also to manage the repository and keep it clean because as soon as we put something in it, it's, 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 it's harvested and it's out there, publicly available for anybody to see. Okay. Um, I might also just take a quick moment to mention that Sun Scholar has recently been ranked um, as the top repository in Africa and 84th in the world. Um, very, we're very proud of this. So the ranking is done by the um, Weber, Weber metrics ranking of world repositories. And what the rank rankings basically do is they take into account the size of the repository, not only the physical size, how many items, but also the file richness of the repository, so how many full text items in your repository. And importantly, they take into account the visibility, so in terms of how the research in, hosted in the repository is picked up by your Google search or whatever. So I'm just going to quickly actually physically go to Sun Scholar for those of you who may not be familiar with it. Um, there we go, that is our research repository. As you can see, it's basically um, the collections um, are according to faculty. So within each faculty, you will find all your departments. And within each department, you will find your collections. For instance, your doctoral theses, inaugural addresses, masters, and also your research articles. Another thing while I'm on Sun Scholar, which I want to point out, which is very important, um, this is an article which was uploaded yesterday. As you can see, it's an article published in 2015. Now, obviously, this, 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 this is an article that was, that was published somewhere else but hosted in the repository, okay? So we're not publishers, we host. This publication, for instance, was published by the Public Library of Science. 
I just want you to realize that one of the jo most important jobs that we have in the repository is to always give the original citation. So the citation you have there will always refer to the original publication. And we need to also have a link there to the original publication. And this is also important when we're going to talk about self-archiving later. So just keep that in mind. Um, it can even be, in this case, it is an open access article, so we are allowed to actually put the published version of the article on our repository. In some cases, we're not allowed to use the published version, but we are allowed to use um, a, the final accepted manuscript of the author. And even in those cases, we will always refer in the citation and the link to the original publication. <coughs> shortly just want to mention two other open access initiatives which is not really the topic of today but just to make people aware of it since we are trying to give also an overview of all the open access initiatives at this university so this this one I'm talking about now is called Sun Digital Collections um, in this case it is not a repository which hosts research output but rather primary sources that may be used for research uh, it's a platform that showcases and provides access to content from the library's unique collections. So we as a library take um, some of our special collections in hard copy, we digitize it and we make it available freely and openly for researchers all over the world. Um, if you are interested, these slides can be emailed to you so that you can get all these links, but there is a link and there's also a link on the library's website if you want to go and look at some digital collections. Another initiative, also I'm not going to dwell on this too long, but it is important that researchers and students know about this, um, and this is an initiative called Sun Journals. What it basically is, is a platform for hosting open access journals online. We use open source software, in this case OJS, um, to host these journals, and this is a service that we offer to journals with an official affiliation with Stellenbosch University. Uh, and it's a service that's offered to them for free. It's very, very important to remember, though, that in these cases, the library is not the publisher. We do not become the publisher. We only host the journal. So the journal itself still um, is, is still responsible for the entire content, the workflow, and everything that goes with it. At the moment, we host about 21 journals. Um, you are welcome to go and have a look at them. I have an example here of just one of our oldest ones, Scientia Militaria, which is a journal which is published by the Military Academy. Basically what it looks like, it's a very, very simple interface um, of a, an electronic journal uh, where one can look at your current issue and get full, full access to, to, or to the full access to the full text PDFs and of course to your archives, et cetera, et cetera. So this is just the front end which the user will see. Okay. okay, one of the things I did say that I wanted to focus on was the Open Access Publication Fund. Um, now this, I'm not sure if anybody is aware of this. Okay, this fund was basically established by the library in 2009 with the idea to help authors who want to publish in peer-reviewed open access journals by subsidizing their author fees. Now, if we talk, we have spoken about author fees or article processing fees. I've recently read an article that these APCs can range literally from $5 to $5,000. So there's really, and I get, I, I get asked actually quite a lot because people would contact me and say that a journal has a, a very, very uh, a pricey APC. Does it mean that it, it's, it's, it's a predatory journal or does it mean that it's not accredited or what? I really cannot answer that question just because APCs differ. You know, it's, this is a whole range. But anyway, this is one way that the library is encouraging publishing in open access 
and actually honouring the university's commitment that it made in signing the Berlin Declaration. So thus far we have funded over 350 articles and it's actually interesting because this also translates into a financial return on investment um, for the university. If one takes into account the money that has been put, there, put out there by the library for researchers and in turn what this has generated for the university in terms of the money they get obviously for every published article. So I think it's important for researchers wanting to publish in open access to be aware of the service um, in the library. At one stage it was a bit touch and go and we didn't know if we, were be, we would be able to, to go forward with it, but we are still going forward with it. So please take note of it. If you want to apply for the funding, um, once again, just go to the open access link on the library's website. You will find a page dedicated to the open access fund and a link to an electronic um, form which you can just fill in. I can just note here that these applications are not administered by ourselves, but actually by the head of the acquisitions department in the library. But uh, you will get all the information you need if you follow that route. Okay. <coughs> okay, now I want to move on to the Stellenbosch University policy on the self-archiving of research output. Um, once again, I'm not sure how many people are aware of this policy. I, I know in certain circles it's not a very popular policy, but I just feel that if we talk about open access at this university, this is something that we need to talk about and spend some time on. This was a policy that was formally adopted by council at Stellenbosch University in December 2014. So it's definitely not something that the library thought out and, you know, to, to, to irritate the researchers. That's, that's not what we're trying to do here. Um, the library is, however, the curator of this policy, and it means that we are responsible for the implementation thereof. So what does it actually mean? The policy requires that every researcher um, or lecturer or student that's publishing, which has a Stellenbosch University affiliation, are required to submit a copy of their peer-reviewed article or conference paper to Sun Scholar, the institutional repository, which is managed by the library. So you might ask yourself why, because just, it just sounds like some extra work and we know that researchers are very busy and it's just a pain and I know that you all have to once a year give your, you know, your, your um, research information through to, to the Division of Research and Development. So lots of admin that you have to do. Why this extra admin? Well, the policy was basically designed in the first place to increase the visibility of Stellenbosch University research output and also to increase access to Stellenbosch University research output. And in this case, we're talking about open access. Um, Another thing we tend to, to overlook is the preservation aspect. This was another reason why this policy came into being. Sun Scholar, as an institutional repository, also preserves the university's research output in one central place. And if I can just maybe illustrate this, you do realize that a lot of our own research output, we actually pay for to get access to. If a researcher publishes in, say for example, an El Safi journal, um, we as the library or as the university actually pay a subscription to that journal, and it's only because of that subscription that we actually have access to our own research output. And we all know what's happening at the moment at universities. We know that times are tough and we know that libraries are suffering. So when a subscription gets cancelled, the access goes. So having an extra or having a copy of the university's research output in the repository is going to at least preserve that access. And I think it's just one thing that we need to keep in mind why it is important to actually self-archive. Another thing is, of course, I just want to see if I'm going to, yes. Another thing is, of course, that um, in most cases these days, funders also 
ask uh, or actually ask that you do comply with self-archiving policies. I don't know if you realize that the NRF, um, they set, in, set out their open access policy last year, I think it was March last year, stating that any researcher that gets funding from the NRF must place a copy of their pub or you know, a copy or a version of their published article or output in a institutional repository, for, in their institutional repository at their institution um, within a year after publication. So, so if we just look at the, this policy in, with regards to what may be submitted, because we keep on talking here about a copy of your article, what does it actually mean? In most cases, most publishers and journals will allow us as a repository to host a postprint of your article or conference paper. And in this case, a postprint, and it's, it's unfortunately we sit here with the term postprint, which is very confusing. It doesn't mean the published article. What it means is the final version of the manuscript, the accepted version of the manuscript. So most publishers will allow us to host this on the repository. So if you are a researcher, if you want to, and this is now not talking about open access directly, but if you want your work to be openly accessible in the repository and you want to comply with the self-archiving uh, policy, just hang on to those postprints, okay, if you have them, because we have no way of getting them from publishers. So. As I said, and you can also read there yourself, this is not the published version. It does not have all the publisher's branding. It will usually either be a PDF document or it can even be a Word document. Okay. What else may be submitted is, in some cases, the publisher's version, the published article as it appears in the journal. Once again, we have to look at what the journal policy says, if they allow it or not. Of course, it will only, or in most cases, only be open access journals who actually allow us to put the final version in the repository. But the one thing that you don't have to worry about is we will make sure that the correct version is placed on the repository. We will not take chances and put things up there which are not allowed up there because we can, come, we, we, we can get into a lot of trouble for that. So if you would like to go this route, um, there are two ways of doing it. Um, you can register to be a submitter yourself by sending an email to scholar at sun.ac.za, which is our um, generic um, email for the repository. But also to make it much easier for you, you can actually just work through your faculty librarian and actually just send a copy of your research output to them. Okay. Let me just see if I've covered all of that. Yeah. Right, um, as I also say to people that there's no um, self-archiving police, so, you know, it's not as if anybody's going to fire you if you do not comply with this policy, but we, we are on a bit of a mission to, to make researchers aware of this policy because it is, as I said, an official policy of this university and more and more, res or more and more funders are actually going this route of wanting people to comply with self-archiving. And more and more journals, I must honestly also say, are making provision for authors to comply with self-archiving policies. Okay. Getting back to open access journals, I want to move on. Uh, okay, so I've talked about the specific open access initiatives of this library. What I want to concentrate now on is if you are interested in going open access, publishing in open access journals, and also using open access literature, where, where do you find it? And one of the first places uh, which you can go to is the Directory of Open Access Journals, DOAJ, where they currently have almost 10,000 journals worldwide listed. And it's a very, very useful resource for finding open access journals to publish in but also for finding information published in open access journals. Um, we have all of our journals that we host on Sun Journals, uh, we have actually registered with the Directory of Open Access Journals. And after going through that process myself, I can tell you 
that using a tool like this, you should realize that it's not just a willy-nilly accumulation of a lot of open access titles. As I said, titles need to be registered. So the DOAJ will actually look at your registration. There are certain things you have to comply with, and they will make a decision of whether this is a proper open access journals, whether all of its policies is, 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 is up to scratch, and it's actually a long list of things that you have to fill in. So, so it's quite a trusted um, database to use. Okay, so I think that's something to keep in mind. Then also when looking for open access journals, if you want to look at things that are accredited, please note that for instance, the Department of Higher Education and Training, their list of accredited journals also clearly indicates which journals are open access. So that's another way of finding open access journals which are accredited and approved. Then, of course, there are many well-known publishers that these days well, are either completely open access or have open access um, uh, options. And some of these might be familiar for you, uh, to you. Biomed Central, oops. Okay. Biomed Central, basically um, um, in the field of medicine, they've been open access right from the start, although, of course, they also do sometimes charge quite high article processing charges. Um, and the Open Access Publication Fund actually has, I suppose, almost half of what we've funded is for publication in Biomed Central. I don't know if there's anybody from Health Sciences, but yeah, just, just to note. Public Library of Science, they've also been open access since forever. And then um, even uh, places like Elsevier have open access options, Springer and all of these other bigger um, journals and uh, publishers like Taylor and Francis all have open access options. Okay, so just to keep that in mind also. Okay, publishing in open access journals. Now all I'm basically going to do here, and this is, I must admit, I'm, I'm, I'm working here from, from, from notes also from one of my colleagues who usually does this presentation, but unfortunately she's not here today. So just pointing out a few things to look out for when choosing an open access journal to publish in. And this might not be news to any of you, but it is part of this presentation, so I thought we should perhaps just quickly run through it. Obviously, firstly, you're going to have to see whether you are dealing with a peer-reviewed journal or not. Okay. Then look at the editorial board. Are there international members in that editorial board? You know, if, if it's not, if it's usually when it's only members from one country, one can start perhaps getting a bit suspicious about the quality of the journal. Look at the quality of the existing papers in the journal. And also look at the visibility of the journal. Um, look at the impact factor. There are open access journals with very high impact factors around. Um, not all of them, but they are. And then, of course, you can use tools like Journal Citation Reports and Simago, which is the Elsevier product, I think. Um, which will tell you if you're looking for the specific impact factor of a specific journal. Okay? We've spoken about the Directory of Open Access Journals. We've spoken about journals accredited by the DHET. And then also look at the other lists of accredita accreditation, for instance, ISI, and complete information um, on these lists uh, of accreditation can be found on the library's OA website and the Division of Research Development website. Also look at researchers publishing in the journal. Are there any names in your field that you recognize? Um, this is not always, we, we actually had a very specific situation of a specific journal um, where I suggested this and uh, the person actually contacted um, a colleague at another university who regular, regularly publishes in this specific journal because we thought that, okay, well, this is a good sign. You know, if Professor so-and-so from Pretoria is publishing in this journal, it must be a good journal. And, and they decided, okay, well, they're going to call Professor so-and-so from Pretoria. And he almost got a heart attack and he said, no, please don't make that mistake. I will never, ever do it again. It's not a proper journal, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, but, 
but you can do that and talk to people in your field if, if, if you are you know, worried about the quality of a journal. Um, just make sure that every journal should have an ISSN or at, 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 at least electronic ISSN, as most journals are only electronic these days, so they must have one of those two or both. Very important that in most proper journals there is a DOI or a digital object identifier for each article, which is that article's unique ID which makes it searchable and findable right throughout the world on any search engine. Um, look at the journal's web page. Is there full information? Look whether the journal issues are published regularly. And also look at licensing and copyright agreements of the journal itself before you even consider publishing it. And the last point there is that there are these so-called predatory journals and publishers. And unfortunately, this has been a spin-off from open access. Um, and we see a lot of this. If, if you do have, there is, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Beale's list. Um, it's a person by the surname of Beale, I can't remember his first name now. He, he publishes a list of predatory journals every year, uh, journals that, that he thinks according to a set of criteria are predatory. But his list is also controversial because they feel that it's only one person's opinion. But if you do have questions about this and you think that you might be looking at a predatory journal, you are welcome to contact us, see if we can figure it out together because this does happen. What we also see happen a lot, yes? It's basically, it's, 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 oh, it's difficult to find, it's, it's, it's basically not a journal. They, 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 they call themselves a journal, they'll have a website and everything looking perfectly, they'll have a, a, a workflow, and they'll ask you to pay an, an article processing charge. And in the end, it's just a fly-by-night thing, they take the money, put it in their pockets, and that's it. And they, I think they call it predatory because it, they, they, it's literally a predation and they're making, um, they're abusing of open access, I think. My question was directed in, in terms of thinking whether there were journals that were using open access papers from others and listing them as part of their articles. That, that's how I interpreted your oh, saying see. predatory journals, okay. but if that's not the case, yeah. I understand what you're saying. And of course, what we see a lot, uh, especially every year after graduation, a lot of students. Um, sorry, do you want to ask them? Yeah, sorry to interrupt you. Mm. Um, on the news, I looked at it Yes, yeah. Now that's important. I, I, I just said that um, I know that in the past there has some, been some criticism on Bill's list. So, yeah. but I take into account what you're saying, and it is important, yes, to, to realize. Definitely, definitely err on the side of caution. I agree with you. Yeah. Anyway, um, just coming back to your know, every year, of course, after graduation, a lot of students get um, all kinds of funny emails from publishers wanting to publish their research. And once again, if you have any queries about that, we actually have kept a list ourselves because these things recur every year. And we have been able to, to help um, lecturers and students to, to just to identify. Um, there's one, I, I can't remember the name now, but, but, a, but a very serious sounding German um, publisher who who claim that they will you know take your, your your PhD thesis or your masters and publish it for free etc etc so just just be on the lookout for those because and it's it's just a pattern every year after graduation students will start getting these emails okay let me just see where I am now okay okay um, we want to talk here about the benefits of open access, and, and I call it here potential benefits. And we have spoken about this earlier also, that 
The fact is that when your research is available out there, openly accessible, it will probably increase your visibility. It should increase usage. It can lead to increased impact. This is very, very difficult to scientifically prove. And I was looking for an article to quote um, just this morning bef bef before I came here, um, looking at some of the latest research. And uh, I, I struggled that the, the last article I found which really sang the praises of open access in terms of the fact that it directly leads to, 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 to impact and citations. The last one I could find was in 2012. And I think it's important also to, to, to keep looking at the research that is done because it is sometimes difficult to draw a direct correlation between open access and increased citations. Okay. So we don't want to disillusion anyone, but the fact is that it is going to be more visible and probably going to be more used. Um, some of the other benefits is that it allows people to build on existing research without costing them anything. In the bigger picture, it can help find solutions to problems um, because of the fact that normal people or people outside the academic community can access um, research articles. Um, and also access to those who cannot afford it and then of course once again meeting funder requirements can also be a benefit. But if we look at this, it's, as I said, it's difficult to say exactly that your citation count is going to increase if you publish open access. But then I found this um, quote the other day which I think makes a bit of sense. It says downloads do not by themselves represent impact, obviously, as we know, but they're the best proxy we currently have for readership, which in turn is the foundation upon which impact is built. And I think this is quite true. And just as an example, um, I took an example of an article that was, that lies on our repository on Sun Scholar, and it's been lying there for two years, and it is one of the most popular articles in the repository. Um, but if you look at that, I mean, 2,235 downloads in two years, it's quite significant. If this article was lying behind a paywall, it, the downloads would have, wouldn't have been so much. So I cannot tell you that this person's H index, had now, H index has now climbed because of this, that research has not been done. But just in terms of talking about benefits of, the op of open access in general, that is the type of thing that can happen, that your research is out there and it can be read and downloaded and this could lead to it being used for research and eventually um, having greater impact. I think that is pretty much my story. I've actually finished a bit earlier, um, are there any questions or comments at this stage?
also apply criteria which I find are crazy, and those are that they inform me about manuscript. Well, it's not scientifically it's perfect, but um, and, uh, would um, be acceptable in terms of its standard. But um, it's not of general enough interest to our readership. You get I've got this from nature and of science, and and these are very very disconcerting statements. In other words, a journal does not want to publish a top scientific contribution. It wants to publish something that the public wants to hear. And these are, I mean, this is just a general problem. Then also what has been happening, in my opinion, in terms of um, journals like Class 1, where I have also published in, is that um, I've, I've found that manuscripts, I also review manuscripts, and I've seen poor manuscripts which have been submitted, and then I have indicated to the editor that I think that they should be rejected and that they are then rejected. Then I find that in identical, without any changes, they then start appearing in clause one, whilst they are in actual fact not good science. Mm -hmm. And what is happening is that um, in the case of the sciences, the clause one is now becoming like the dump site where anything else that gets rejected from higher up journals are being accepted there. And that then has to do again with the editor plus editorial panel of a journal as to whether they decide whether a um, manuscript is acceptable in the publication or not. But there are other tendencies that I find disconcerting, and those are that when I get reviews back, some of the reviewers are writing you know, such short comments that they, in actual fact, in terms of the scientific criticism that they're delivering, that is substandard. And, and so there are major problems in the reviewing process. One of the big problems in sciences at the moment are that there are so many papers that are being published or that people must publish because they receive research funding one wants to make this information available, but that they compete for, for a, a, a number of journals and then there are these very high-powered journals with their high-impact indices so-called, and then they set the level so high that you know, they quite enjoy rejecting I mean, it's completely contradictory. So I find the whole publication scenario at the moment, for anyone in the, the younger fraternity coming into this, very frustrating because there are all these like old boys' cliques and, and things like that where you know, you're not allowed in because you're not part of the big deal. And particularly if you're in the third world, you're very exposed to this. And so the criteria for exception, that they, you know, for why publications are accepted are often very dubious. I'm not finding that open access is actually improving this. I mean, we're a couple of years down the line now. But you see, Harry, I just, I just take it as well. I don't think, I can understand the issue. I don't think that your open access is, is helping in that regard. But I do think there is some criticism, I think, about this, like you said, is that because of the, the, the masses out there and the fact that it has become so easy in a certain sense to, you know, Thank you. 